I'm Uma, and this is John, and we're going to present uh, on succinct verification of consensus with ZK SNARKs. Uh, this was work we did over the summer, funded by Xerox Park and Gnosis DAO. Okay. Okay, so let's just take a 10,000 foot view of kind of the multi chain and cross chain landscape today. So, over the past few years, there have been many different blockchains that have come online that lie on different points of the trade off curve of throughput, security, decentralization, and transaction fees. And we can debate whether or not it makes sense to have one ultimate global settlement layer, like Ethereum, or whether it makes sense for there to be different ledgers and different settlement layers for different use cases. Some people would argue that there should be multiple decentralized blockchains, kind of as like a meta point of decentralization. Others would disagree. But it's really hard to predict the future and how these debates will play out, but we can look at the present. And in the present, it's an undebatable fact that as the number of applications has grown across different chains, there's a lot of user demand for interacting between these chains. In particular, user, users often want to transfer assets from one chain to another, and builders are currently exploring interesting cross-chain communication use cases that go beyond asset transfer. A large selling point of crypto versus like the previous generation of internet applications is trustless, permissionless interoperability. And so in the future, if users do want to use multiple decentralized settlement layers, it's important that those blockchains can communicate with each other in a secure and permissionless manner. And because of this, we think bridges are critical infrastructure in this space and as important as the underlying blockchains themselves. OK, so what does the current state of bridging look like? Currently today, to meet user demands, the solutions for cross-chain communication and transferring assets between chains is through extremely centralized entities. The vast majority of L1 bridges are built on top of a centralized multi-sig architecture, where a centralized entity controlled by a multi-sig signs off on deposits and withdrawals. And it's kind of a travesty that cross-chain bridging is this weak link in the blockchain space. There's a ton of money that flows through these bridges, and it's flowing through these centralized entities that are censorable, have really high trust assumptions, and empirically have been much less secure. So even in the past year, there have been many hacks of various different um, bridges, uh, resulting in billions of dollars of user funds um, being taken. And I would argue this is not only bad for the users, which in and of itself, that it's really bad, it's actually bad for the entire space because it reduces the credibility of the space and then leads to downstream consequences that are pretty severe, like regulation. OK, so I've talked a lot about why the current state of bridging is far less than desirable. So let's start talking about solutions. What if we forgot about the practical limitations of on-chain computation and how expensive that is, and thought from first principles about what a maximally secure and trust-minimized bridge between L1s would look like? So if we forget about the computational constraints of on-chain uh, computation, the solution that comes to mind is simple and kind of elegant. We already have a protocol for a decentralized set of validators to agree on the state of blockchain. It's called a consensus protocol. What if we were simply able to verify the consensus of a source chain in the execution layer of a target chain? Then there would be no additional security or trust assumptions placed on this bridge between the source and target chain. Although, of course, you can't get better economic security than the economic security of the consensus of the source chain. And even if we verify consensus on a target chain, it's important to note we're not able to get synchronicity between the different chains. That's like fundamentally impossible. But the key here is that we're able to do much better than the current centralized solutions for cross-chain communication. So now that Uma has talked about why we want to build trust minimized bridges and how maybe the ideal bridge is a bridge secured by consensus itself, let's have a high-level overview about how we might build something like this. So we have some decentralized blockchain, like Ethereum, and we're trying to bridge information out of it. While Ethereum is running, it's generating a bunch of information, such as block headers, validator signatures, attestations, and other metadata as part of its consensus process. Normally, this information is just relayed to other honest validators. But what if we also relayed this information to a smart contract on another blockchain, such as Gnosis Chain? And let's imagine we have a smart contract which re-implements the code that an honest validator would run to decide what a valid block header is. The reason why this is very powerful is that if we can verify consensus on another chain, 
we have trustless access to these block headers, which can then inclusion prove any state of Ethereum on another chain. So for example, if we want to know what, how much Ether I have in my wallet on Gnosis chain, we just pass in a Merkle proof, proving that the storage slot corresponding to my Ether balance is the following. And we can basically verify any information, such as contract state, account state, transactions, events, and anything more. Well, why hasn't this been done before? Well, the problem is that implementing consensus verification in a contract is generally very expensive and difficult. Um, in particular, for Ethereum, there are two big challenges. First of all, you have to keep track of all the validators, how much they have staked, who's leaving, uh, who withdrew their stake, who added more stake, and who has been slashed. And because this state has to all be on chain, it is prohibitively expensive. The second thing is that we have to verify these BLS 12 381 uh, signatures, which are currently not supported on the EVM, as there are no precompiles uh, for this curve. So this problem of verifying consensus cheaply is actually a problem that extends outside of even just smart contracts. Verifying Ethereum to consensus is even hard on consumer-grade hardware. So to solve this problem, Ethereum 2 proposes the Sync Committee, which is essentially an easy-to-verify consensus mechanism for light clients on Ethereum. To reduce the cost of consensus verification, they reduce the 400,000 validators down to a set of 512 validators, which are randomly chosen every 27 hours. As you might imagine, these validators essentially just sign the block headers they see. And if there are enough participation by this, by this validation set, the block header is considered valid. The trade-off here is that the sync committee has much weaker security guarantees, as the amount of stake up to slashing is only equivalent to the ether stake by these 512 validators. However, even when you reduce the problem of consensus down to just these 512 validators, verifying this consensus on chain is still too gas expensive. So why is this? Well, the problem is that you have to store these 512 validators' public keys every 27 hours, as, as well as prove the rotation of these uh, validator sets which rotate every 27 hours. Furthermore, again, I want to reemphasize that the elliptic curves used to validate these signatures are currently not supported on the EVM. And inside this smart contract, you're essentially going to have to do up to 512 curve additions and one pairing check on this curve for every block header you want to update. So how do we solve this problem? Well, we're going we're gonna to use the magical technology of zero-knowledge proofs to create succinct on-chain consensus verification. So the naive way to implement consensus verification would be to have some smart contract which implements this function, which has some pre-processing step. It verifies the current validator set. And then it's going to verify a bunch of BLS signatures. Well, what we can do is we can move this expensive computation off-chain, roll it up into a ZK snark, and then just verify a GRAS 16 proof on-chain, which can be computed very cheaply. So to recap, we've essentially showed how zero-knowledge proofs can provide a roadmap for creating gas-efficient light clients on different blockchains. And I personally think that this is very exciting, as we've already seen how zero-knowledge proofs can scale execution through the ZK EVM. But this also suggests that ZKPs can also scale the composability of blockchains by making it easier to verify consensus on, on a, a wide variety of blockchains. So to leverage this opportunity and to accelerate this mission of building trust minimized cross-chain communication, we've developed Succinct Labs, which is an R&D org dedicated to developing ZK snarks for succinct verification of consensus. And beyond cross-chain communication, we're also excited about applications including ultra-lightweight light clients, uh, faster node syncing, and other applications. Cool. So John kind of covered the high-level overview of you're, using, you're taking on this expensive computation to verify consensus. That's really expensive to do on-chain. We have to move it off-chain in a snark, and then we verify the snark on-chain. So let's get into some of the details. So the sync committee in ETH2 does two things. The first thing it does is some subset of the validators will so have produce an aggregate BLS signature of a block header they think is valid. And so every update that we want in this light client, we need to basically verify an aggregated BLS signature. That's really hard to do right now because we don't have pre-compiles for that in EVM, although it's important to note that that is coming. So once those come, we can compare the snark approach versus the pre-compile approach. Um, but the first snark we implemented basically implements uh, verifying an aggregate BLS signature from a subset of public keys that we know, that's the validators in the sync committee, and verifying the signature for a given header. 
The other thing the sync committee does, as John mentioned, is rotate the set of validators in the sync committee. It's important that the validators rotate, you know, and in this case, they rotate every 27 hours to basically ensure for, for security reasons. And so the second thing we do is in the SNARK, we verify that the current sync committee signed off on a new sync committee. Uh, and, to, and we have a little trick in here to really reduce gas costs that I'll dive into in more detail later. Okay, so for those ZK uh, circuits that I described in the previous slide, uh, we had to build certain primitives. Um, and so I'm just gonna go through a few of them. We hope that these primitives that we built are useful more broadly to future projects and are reusable. And we're planning to document them extensively and open source our repo next week so that other people can use them. Um, so yeah, just to go over some of the primitives, uh, the first thing we have to do is take the set of validators that are in the sync committee and generate an aggregated public key, so add up their public keys for the validators that participated. The next primitive we did was implementing verification of a BLS signature for a block header. In this primitive, we extensively used work by Yi and Jonathan, who are in the audience today. Um, they did an amazing job implementing pairing in a SNARK, and we used that primitive uh, to implement the BLS, aggregate BLS signature verification in, um, in conjunction with our first primitive. We also had to implement SSD serialization, which is a serialization format that ETH2 uses, uh, which is used in you know, checking that certain things are inclusion proved inside these headers. Uh, we had to implement that in a SNARK. And then we had various other primitives, like you know, hashing a message to the field that is involved in like BLS signature verification, and also commit, um, computing a SNARK-friendly commitment uh, to the sync committee, which I'll go over in a little bit. But yeah, we hope that these primitives are more generally useful uh, for projects in the future as well. And then, yeah, just to talk about the trick for reducing gas costs of storing public keys um, in a little more detail. So SNARKs have public and private inputs. And public inputs, if we're verifying a SNARK on chain, must be also stored on chain because they're public. So that's why they're in red, because they're bad, because that costs gas. And uh, the private inputs are green. It's good, because those are not visible. And so we don't have to put those on chain. So naively, if you were to implement the verification of um, the sync committee signing off on a header, you would have the header as the public input, you'd, and you'd also have the validator public keys as a public input, because you need to make sure that the signature is from the set of validators. You can't just it, validate a signature from like random public keys. That doesn't tell you anything. You need to make sure the public keys involved are indeed the public keys of the validators. Um, but storing public keys on chain is really expensive. There's 512 of them. and so. Our idea was, OK, what if we store a commitment to the public keys instead? So basically, a hash of the public keys. So now we can make the public keys, which is very large and expensive, a private input, which is good. That turns green. And then our commitment, uh, is, which is much shorter, which, because it's just a hash, becomes a public input. But the issue with this is we have to update the commitment when the sync committee rotates. So we have this trick to basically update the commitment. and so. Let's just talk about like, what we can even use as a commitment. So when signing the rotation of this sync committee, the current set of validators sign this SSZ, which is basically this like, hash ETH2 uses, as I mentioned, of the public keys. And so we could just use this SSZ of the public keys as the commitment. But the issue is that the SSZ is very snark unfriendly. It's a bunch of SHA hashes. And it's expensive to compute in every header verification snark. We don't want to do that. And so we use this trick when using the SNARK to update the sync committee that maps the SNARK unfriendly SSC to a SNARK friendly commitment. So basically, we take the new public keys, we prove that it's equal to the SSC that uh, the current set of validators are signing off on, and then we compute a SNARK friendly hash of the new public keys, and we return that friendly hash. So we're able to link this unfriendly hash with a friendly hash. And what this does uh, is it saves us 70 million constraints in the header verification snark. So the header verification snark is the one that runs for every single header we want uh, on the light client. And so saving 70 million constraints is a lot, because that's the snark that we're uh, computing frequently. Whereas this snark is only run once every 27 hours when we rotate the validators. So hopefully this trick might be useful in like other contexts as well. Cool. So. Basically, uh, we've been in the weeds for a little bit, but let's just talk about at a high level uh, what we've been able to accomplish with these two different SNARKs. With these two different SNARKs, we have a succinct on-chain light client that allows for trust-minimized arbitrary cross-chain communication. And as John mentioned, 
Once you have these headers in this like client, then you can prove account state, storage state, transactions, event logs, and really anything you want. And once we built this protocol, so we built it uh, for cross-chain communication, we wanted to build an example of what you can do when you have this. Uh, and John's going to go into the demo. Yeah, so for the past few months, we've been working on the SNARKs, and we actually got um, the light client working. And on top of this uh, light client, we actually built a prototype bridge we're calling Tesseract, which is secured by the Ethereum 2 sync committee. And you can visit it at succinct.xyz. It's still in beta, and the mobile support is horrible, so <laughs> for forgive us. But anyways, yeah, like it's a pretty much a standard bridge. Like You connect your wallet. You choose the token you want to bridge. Um, the networks you want to bridge from and to. And like, just to clarify, like because our bridge is secured by the Ethereum 2 sync committee, we can only bridge from and to Ethereum 2 based chains. But anyways, yeah, like you deposit your assets into the bridge. Um, and basically, what happens on the back end is that once you make a deposit onto the bridge, what, wants, what needs to happen is that the light client on the target chain, the chain you're bridging to, has to have a block header which can prove that you've made a deposit. So with Ethereum, the finalization period is like around two epochs, which I think is 14 minutes. So you have to wait that amount of time. And you also have to wait for the time to generate the proofs. But once that has passed, um, you're Basically, a relayer node will initiate a withdrawal transaction, which will provide an inclusion proof, proving that you've made a deposit on Ethereum, and you'll be happy and you'll have all your assets. And yeah, this is an example, like Etherscan transaction, showing that um, our contracts are working. Um, but yeah, zooming out a bit, like I want to talk about some of the pros and cons of building a bridge like Tesseract, which is secured by consensus itself. So the obvious pros are that there's much higher security guarantees. Right? It's censorship resistant, because if we open source the code for generating these snarks, anyone can generate them, anyone can submit updates to the light client. And in general, it's just much more decentralized. The cons that are that in the short term, there's probably higher gas costs, especially when you compare it to multi-sig and Oracle-based bridges. Because to update the light client, you're going to have to do a few pairing checks um, to verify the GROS16 proof. Furthermore, there's higher latency, because you're going to have to generate the ZK snarks to also verify um, the light client updates efficiently on chain. However, with new proving systems like Halo 2, um, I think we're pretty confident that we can bring it down um, even maybe under a minute. Furthermore, to scale this up to become a general cross-chain communication protocol, we're, we're going to have to implement new snarks for new consensus protocols, which is going to be a developer bottleneck. Now, as a quick aside, I want to point out that there are some dangers to building an ecosystem where we heavily rely on cross-chain applications. Um, Vitalik had this really good Twitter thread a few months ago um, that was based on an essay he wrote on Reddit. And basically, the claim he makes is that cross-chain applications are very dangerous to rely on in the case of 51% tax and reorgs. And in particular, when you build a bridge between two chains, right, like the security of the bridge is equivalent to the minimum of the two chains. So if you have this ecosystem where you connect all the blockchains together with the arbitrary cross-chain communication protocol, in some sense, um, if you over-rely on the bridge, the entire ecosystem is exposed to the weakest link. So when we build br bridges and cross-chain communication protocols, we really want to emphasize that applications have to build in mind um, with this reality in mind. And for example, for bridging assets, uh, we think, for example, like cross-chain swaps are a much better idea versus just like minting tokens arbitrarily on other chains. So our future roadmap is basically, we want to be basically the most trust-minimized interoperability protocol for Ethereum and other decentralized platforms. And in the short term, we're pretty excited about trying to ZK snark full or a partial subset of Ethereum consensus, as the sync committee doesn't provide that much econo economic security. We're also excited about building succinct light clients for other consensus protocols. And finally, we're really excited about um, other ways that people can use our light clients beyond ERC-20 bridging. And in general, we're super excited about collaborating with people, so we'd love to hear um, what people's thoughts are on this. Anyways, yeah. And finally, I want to thank uh, Gnosis Dow, especially Martin and Stefan, and uh, at Xerox Park, Brian, Yi, and Jonathan for helping with this work. And yeah, thanks for listening. Let us know if you have any questions or comments, and yeah, feel free to follow us on Twitter. So since we are running low on time, we're going to ask for this presentation onwards that you, do, you're, you redirect your questions to presenters either after the sessions or on Twitter via the SBC ZK Guild uh, anonymous Q&A bot. Um, but yeah, let's thank our speakers again.